Our speaker today is Dr. Vincent Ludi. He is a professor emeritus at UMass in Amherst, correct? Nope. No? Downtown. Oh, downtown. My, my, my mistake. He taught for over 35 years. He's the author of at least two books, Mallet and Stone and Death Remembered. Um, he's written quite a few articles regarding gravestones in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, he does have his books, uh, I believe you brought them in, right, up here for review. Um, and he does have order forms if anybody's interested in purchasing in Death Remembered. Um, he has taken over 7,000 gravestone photos in New England, which um, puts him in competition with Mr. Chip Mangio, who has done more than his fair share of gravestone photos as well for Find a Grave. Um, but he's got some beautiful photographs here today. Um, there will be titles on the slide that will tell you whose gravestone you're looking at, and he'll give us the details, um, I'm sure. And he's more than happy to stay and answer questions um, after the presentation. And there will be board members present afterwards as well, if anybody wants to know about his uh, historical society. And without further ado, Mr. Ludi. I'm a little nervous because you people know more about the brick walls than I do. <laughs> if I make any gaps, uh, come up and whisper in my ear. <laughs> Do my best. Now, the Bridgewaters are a crossword of the work of a number of gravestone carvers of the 18th century. To the east, Plymouth County carvers, and to the west, Bristol County carvers. We will look at and hear about the works of the Bridgewater Carvers, Bonnie Leonard and Nathan Haywood, but also Carvers John and James New, Cephas Thompson, Asa Soul, and others whose work is found in the Bridgewaters, and that includes North Bridgewater. I won't refer to the name of the town. <laughs> it is North Bridgewater and was North Bridgewater at this time. Okay, here we go. Barney Leonard of Bridgewater and his shop. The the only thing I could find is there's, there's a B Leonard over there uh, on this old map, and that might be his home since uh, the uh, Scotland Cemetery is nearby, and he has a lot of works there, and he's buried there. Bonnie Leonard was the son of Seth Leonard and Ruth Hoare, both of Taunton and was born in 1757. And often, at 14, he may have apprenticed with David Lincoln of Norton. But in 1774, age 16, he asked to be put under the guardianship of Jonathan Carver, a prosperous merchant of Taunton. His gravestone carving work seems to have begun at this time, that is, as a teenager. He did service in the Revolutionary War and was listed as from Bridgewater. In 1780, he married Phoebe Barrett of Bridgewater. It appears that he set up home and shop and farm on North Street in Bridgewater, as we consider. He is called a young man in documents, but also gravestone cutter in documents, as early as 1778, age 21. He died in 1821 and is buried in a Scotland cemetery near his, what I think was his home. Now, since the Bridgewaters straddle two distinct carving traditions, 
Bobby Lennon was a kind of gatekeeper of sorts, drawing on Bristol County designs to the west and to the east, Plymouth County designs for his own work, but putting his peculiar stamp on them. In the 1770s and 1780s, an unfolding frond design, variously elaborated, predominates in his work, as we shall see in the following images. The frond is just a word we give to the design uh, uh, somewhat like a fern frond, but it is something unfolding, leafy, unfolding. Now, in this stone, for a Bethiah Keith in the Scotland Cemetery, is not by Byron Leonard, but by what was probably his master, David Lincoln of Norton. And the unfolding drawn design, this is a David Lincoln stone, very typical, and the unfolding drawn is all over the stone, in the arch called the tympanum, and down in the borders. Uh, it's a very elegant design, and David Lincoln was a quite, quite uh, fine uh, sculptor. Uh, his letter is particularly wonderful. Anyway, uh, the unfolding font design created, created by Lincoln, which by Leonard will adopt, is linked in elegant configurations in the Templar and borders. All Taunton River Basin Carvers will adopt this basic design in their work. Here is Lonnie Leonard's simplest version of the stone. My head before folds in the Scotland Cemetery. Uh, here, the unfolding form is a double facing centered design. The geometric intestine design seems to be a Leonard invention. In all the world, I can't look at his stones without thinking intestine. <laughs> uh, people will never know what he intended by it. <laughs> now, in this stone of uh, Keziah uh, Packard, in South Cemetery, uh, there are two fronds that are stacked around the Templar Mount, another variation. Now, this stone is actually uh, in Canton, but here we have the stacking around the arch and also in the center, much more elaborate, obviously more costly as well. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, like to look next at a stone in Scotland Cemetery for Mary Snow. Mm -hmm. And now we have a full array of his skills. All the prongs round in the center, and now with the addition of what looks like a tulip. In this one, uh, it's the problem that I've ever seen. I don't know why, but he got it. He drilled holes in the front figure. Uh, I have no idea. Except David Lincoln did it regularly, but not uh, a little more elegantly, you might say. At least I don't want it looks like BB shots. I'm not <laughs> sure if someone did take a pot shot at the stone, because we all have. Um, all right. Barney Leonard's few effigy stones are from this period in the 1770s and 80s. He did not do a great many of them, 
but they are all charming and interesting. Here's one for Polly Leonard, his daughter. Uh, the typical effigy of Bonnie Leonard with the fat face, the bulging Plymouth Colony style eyes, the pointed cap, also from Plymouth County style. Note the variety of feather figurations typical of his work. Uh, there is no rhyme or reason, he just like to make designs in the feathers. Uh, and of course, the uh, <coughs> signature intestine design. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one is uh, quite interesting. Um, in, I, don't, I think it's a Trinity Cemetery for Lyre of Bones. I don't understand why he broke the arch at the top and let the dots go flying upward for uh, some kind of ascension. A uh, handsome stone. And Marcy Kingman, right? Marcy Kingman now has the addition of the heart. That is the symbol that's found throughout New England gravestones. Uh, you can read it any way you want. And many authors have variously interpreted the use of the heart. Uh, but what's most interesting now, again, the feathers, this obsession with designing them uh, not to look like feathers. Who knows what he had in mind? Uh, a torso added, and the whole thing is, I say, uh, striking. No one else could work like this. You know, oh, that's a Bobby Leonard stone. Just unique to his present work. Okay, now a sad story. <laughs> this is a Samuel Willis. Uh huh. Let me find him. Uh, in a powder house cemetery. The photo was taken some 30 years ago. It is in decent condition. Uh, there is some lighting, lighting uh, going on it. Uh, what is interesting is the, um, the optical illusion. If you look at that long enough, it starts taking on different configurations. I just found that amusing. But what isn't amusing is here is a photo taken not too long ago on the same stone. Oh. It's essentially gone. And it goes all the way down. You hard to read it. It is gone. And if I haven't taken that photograph and one of the whole stone, that's it. That's all we have. So, uh, for you photographers, I, I'll be very, shall we say, uh, careful to clean the stone, get some good light on it, because that photograph you take may be the last remnant of that particular stone. Now, unfortunately, the uh, effigies uh, went out of style. Following in the 1790s, following a widespread spread trend among gravestone carpenters, the rising sun became uh, an overwhelming obsession with carpenters. Everybody was doing them. They're not ever. They're not very interesting, but Frank Lennon made his interesting by the scalloping around the eyes. And that's the only thing that distinguishes his from anyone else. 
all the way. Um, and then, very sadly, after 1800, half-heartedly, he joined the grand classical urn and willow <laughs> movement of the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very sad. Yeah. Doing a few with the most uninspired girl of the <laughs> His fine throng in effigy stones were out of style now, and he gave up. His son, Barney Jr., was also a carver, 19th century carver, but mostly in Rhode Island, where he was murdered. Now, carvers in the Barney Leonard shop, Carver X, and he shall remain forever Carver X. <laughs> I hope someone finds his name, but I'm telling Another hand appeared in the Leonard shop doing only lettering on the stones in the 1770s. I also found some most charming and rather rare skull stones in my travels uh, that no one had ever attributed. And when I looked closely at them, they contained the same lettering hand as on a few of Barney Leonard's stones. This then was some kind of apprentice in Barney Leonard's shop, and his skull uh, is quite charming and quite unique. However, they only lasted for a few years, and then they're gone. After 1781, I couldn't find any more, only a handful. So I don't think we're ever going to know who this uh, I, I like these stones, but you know, everyone I find is like a uh, discovery. Uh, quite, quite nice. Now, let's move to another carving shop, that of John New and his son James New. John New was born in 1722 in West Grantham. He married Marcy Adams in 1743. And eight years later, his turmoils began. He had received a gift of land from his father, James, in 1751, when he turned 21. But he turned right around and sold it. And with the money, bought 50 acres of land in North Attleboro where actually where the uh, fish hatchery is located, National Fish Hatchery, is on John New's property. Apparently, he and his family did not move there until later. Then, in 1752, money was requested from the town of Rentham for maintaining the new family. On January 14, 1757, Judge Thomas Hutchinson of Boston, upon request of the new family, ordered the selectmen of Redmond to make inquisition into news condition. And on March 4, 1757, the judge declared John New non compos mentis. <laughs> and a guardian was appointed. In this tragic period, he ran away and had to be retrieved, and his wife and children found out. Some of his North Attleboro land was sold to meet expenses for the maintenance. In 1762, the guardianship expenses ceased in Attleboro. It is precisely at this time 
that some of John Dillon's best gravestones began appearing profusely in the South Shore towns from Weymouth down to Plymouth. A relative by marriage, Dr. Dr. David Jones of Renfrew, had moved to Abington in the South Shore. I feel certain that it was Dr. Jones who brought you to Abington in the South Shore to Carl and perhaps was attending to his mental illness. Around 1768, after a few years, carved an enormous number of stones in the South Shore towns, he returned to Rantham, gathered up his family, and set up on his North Attleboro property, today at the site of the National Fish Hatchery. In 1782, he ran for governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought, his wife Marty died in 1788. Her stone is full of beauty, grief, and resignation. Uh, John's new face. 
the sad owl eyes the bulbous note. But note the globe of radiance around the face of that zigzaggy. John, you invented this zigzag design of heavenly energy, radiance, you name it. Something was in his mind. And it was picked up by professional carvers of the 19th century. You see it in their work. He invented it, John. Hill. Accompanying the effigy, we see the firmament with its sun face, moon, and stars through which the soul ascends to the radiance of heaven a spectacle of joyous resurrection. I should mention that when you see these faces on the 18th century stones, we generically call them soul effigies. They're not a representation of the person as much as the soul of the person. And John Hume uh, has the soul ascending through this magnificent firmament. And no other kind of did it like it. The stone is in North Bridgewater. <coughs> and here is the same idea again. And in this case, this is the effigy. Uh, has a lovely bonnet, face, a nice necklace, a shirt, gown, but it is not the person. It's not some people are standing behind these portrait stones. Okay, they're not portraits. They couldn't be. It's a representation of that person's soul, and here we know why because it's ascending through the heavens. There are all the simple things. And look at the wonderful zigzag radiance all over the place, uh, emanating from the sun and the moon. He had uh, anticipated the theory of light uh, waves and radiance and energy moving through space with this design. <laughs> a fancy of mine, that he, uh, he had some uh, pre-knowledge of the way energy travels in space, accompanying the soul. Um, and let's see who's next here. Now, that's, uh, by the way, that stone is in Norfolk, uh, not uh, in Bridgewater. But here's one that is in uh, North Bridgewater. Silence Bryant, again, with that imposing uh, effigy face and the accompanying, I don't know what the accompanying foliage design might signify. But it's a wonderful creation. Uh, here's one quite charming, in the um, Manly Street Jerusalem Cemetery, the husband and wife. John who got the idea from the Geithers of Boston, a German family of high art skills, often to that design. Nose attempt is weaker when compared to theirs, much so. The crown up above is a crown of righteousness. This, I'm not sure whether it's John New or his son James New. It's in uh, Jerusalem Cemetery. Uh, probably John New. <coughs> uh, what is interesting about it is the odd winged face. And 
below Again, uh, going by lettering and some details in there, it could be John uh, in one of his fine moments. All right, now, James New, son of John New. James New was born in 1751 in Wrentham, and in 1775, he enlisted in the army from Bridgewater, not Rentham. It was a company of recruits from Bridgewater and neighboring towns. This would contribute to where he placed his stones. Before 1775 and after, his work is distributed in the Bridgewaters between his father's territories to the east and west of the Bridgewater. James Newton's early work in his father's shop was quite, quite crude, and in time he hit his stride and developed his own style with a charming winged uh, effigy, moon face. Uh, in this case, what's also interesting is the tablet design. That's a uh, temperature where the information is that, uh, quite interesting. And overhead, the all see eye. It's a, 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 an accomplished work, to say the least. In, uh, by 1790, however, he left the area and moved about in central Massachusetts, still placing stones in the Bridgewater, however, <coughs> particularly North Bridgewater. He lived in Grafton, Bellingham, Medway, Holliston, relying on a stone carving for a living. Must have been very important. On one of his stones in Sutton, in doggerel poetry, on the deceased tablature, where the text is placed, he actually warned the viewers to have gravestones cut, or else your dear ones will be forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and under it says, a monitor, a warning. <laughs> Alas, it was James New who was forgotten. <laughs> uh, here it is, I want to start, and it has uh, a handsome border design which uh, he appropriated from his father, and here's the little cherub, winged cherub, that goes with it. This is Susanna Perkins in North Bridgewater. Uh, Yeah, and here's another uh, of his typical uh, cherubic looking wing effigies. Again, with the radiance uh, filling in the background uh, of the glorious ascent. Now, John New, James New had another design. There were he had two basic designs. One was the cherubic uh, effigy, and then he had this one. This is Sarah Haley in South Cemetery, 1777. A moon-faced effigy torso in arch, which I assume is the gateway to heaven, 
and the trees of life and the zigzag rails. It's a striking, handsome design, uh, quite unique to James Newman. And a version for a minister with the addition of the call. a joint new stone. Uh, it is in um, Marshfield. A Revolutionary War soldier. And uh, compare John New's work, very charming, with a crude imitation by his son James. <laughs> uh, this stone is <laughs> More interesting for the epitaph. An epitaph which is absolutely mind boggling. I have asked people, what is it saying? What is it saying? <laughs> and uh, the best I could get, uh, he and his wife had some problems. <laughs> and she they left him, it's, she's talking, it's her talking in the epitaph. And she's very, being very mysterious about what happened to her husband, to say the least. <laughs> okay. Um, now. John New, as I have said, had strange, erratic swings of competence. But in this stone, in Weymouth, he rose to the heights of New England gravestone carving. It belongs in a museum. It is deteriorating. It is for a doctor and his wife, obviously well to do, and she is magnificently displayed. Uh, and the doctor, in his impressive way, is holding up some kind of tools of the trade, but uh, the damage has started, and I can't figure out what he's holding in his hands. But nevertheless, uh, in all of New England, you won't find anything quite like this. It is extraordinary. Uh, again, art is close to madness. It's in uh, a South Shore town. All right. And now let's move to another one of his accomplishments. This is just a detail of a magnificent stone in Lancaster. Extraordinarily done. This is hardly a man, a work of a deranged man. It's a work of an artist, a folk artist, whose Skills could rise to extraordinary accomplishments. I should have a picture of the whole stone. Beautiful. Quite, quite beautiful. Okay, now let's move on. And leave the news in peace. I have. Okay, now, all that you see is work that I have worked on, and written on, and published, etc. The remaining covers, which I didn't research, and whose work is found in the Bridgewaters, were researched and written by Peter Banish in the Masks of Orthodoxy. 
which an extraordinary work dealing with Plymouth County Congress of the 18th century, quite extraordinary. And the other book that I used was James Bachowitz's From Slate to Marble, it's in two volumes actually, and again, he worked uh, almost exclusively with Plymouth County College, and that's where I went to get the following information. Nathan Haywood of Bridgewater, a fine car. He was born in 1720. Haywood's domes begin appearing in the 1740s. And along with William Cushman of Middleborough, was the leading carver in Plymouth County at that time. Nathan Haywood of Bridgewater had an enormous impact on the first and second generation of the Soul family carvers of Plymouth, especially Ebenezer Soul children. So we see that Nathan Haywood of Bridgewater had influence upon a good number of other carvers and it was considerable. Hayward did impressive, elegant, stylized skull work and bold, sculpted, winged effigies. He had two designs, skull and winged effigy. No single study has ever been done on Hayward. Uh, there are references to him, though, in James Blackwood's book and, uh, and in Peter Bainish's book. And I, as I say, all I can find is what they can find, which is sketching. Uh, a study, a full length study needs to be done on Nathan Hayward. <coughs> Here is one of his uh, handsome winged effigies. He had a bold carving technique in the relief. Is Quite, quite hard, and the work is very, very professional. All right, now, if you're looking for his work, uh, look for Here Lies Buried. For some reason, he uses the italic form of the letters L, I, and E in an otherwise Roman font. That's the only way I can identify his work. They don't mention it, but I, I said, what's this man doing? Mixing italic and Roman. Okay, uh, now, uh, he died young, uh, however, in 1794. There's another one of his wonderful effigies. South yeah. uh, characterized by the bulging eyes of Plumas County Carvers, the uh, wonderful scrolly wig and the flipping wings. It's very striking when you walk into that cemetery to see his work. And this one, he gives it some fancy uh, design work, lid and fashion silver wing. No reason at all. And lovely border, lovely border. Very, very fine uh, cover, and you can understand why he was so influential on other covers, so many other covers. So that's the Eloise cover. And now, Lemuel Savory of Plymouth. Lemuel Savory was born in 1757 and apprenticed with William Coy, his brother in law of Plymouth. Coy was a house painter and was best known for his great stone carving. 
Uh, I've worked with Chase Blackworth on uh, William Coy because William Coy originated in Providence, Bristol, Rhode Island, and Providence, and then moved to uh, Hamlet County, where he became a, a major, major common figure. After his marriage, oops, I'm on. I get back up here. Yeah, it was after his marriage that uh, Lemuel Savory left Plymouth, but thereafter there is not much information or even when he died. He probably died around 1795 at age 40. His work is quite nice and is discussed in one in volume uh, uh, by James Blackwood's Slate to Mongol. And this stone is in the Jerusalem Cemetery for a couple. Lemuel said his work is characterized by a very charming, plump face, uh, but there isn't that much of it around. Okay. Now, Cephas, Cephas, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Cephas Thompson of Middlebottom. It was born in Middlebottom in 1775 married Olive Haywood in 1802. His lifetime home was over here on River Road, close to the Bridgewater boundary. Uh, uh, um, Cephas Thompson was a famous early 19th century portrait artist. I uh, can't help wondering if one of those isn't a work of his. He was self-taught, and in the winter of the years 1800 to 1825, he traveled the East Coast as an itinerant portrait painter. His portraits are found in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Milwaukee Museum of Art, the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, and a good number of all places in the Bristol, Rhode Island Historical Society. If you could see them, uh, his work, uh, it is very well done. And go on the internet much information on him on the internet. And as an afterthought, the internet says he also carved gravestones. <laughs> I like to think he was a gravestone carver who also painted <laughs> uh, And again, when I first saw those, I thought, oh, one of them's got to be my secret concert. <laughs> They're, they're uh, very highly prized, to say the least. He retired to his farm over here at age 50, gave up everything, and farmed. And he died in 1856. Now, this uh, is a big mystery. I have no idea if it's by Cephas Thompson or not. I have to assign it to someone. I can't assign it to anyone else based on lettering, design, you name it. And all I can think of it might be a work of his, I don't know. Anybody, any ideas of what those things stand for? It's cryptic to say the least. I have no idea what was in the card of mine. But here is a typical uh, Cephas Thompson effigy with the jowl 
Uh, they're charming. They're charming. There are a good number of them around. Uh, and the bed torso and their arched wings. This uh, work is quite fine, quite interesting. And here's another, that one, uh, 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 who was that one? It's in the. Uh, I'm not sure, but this one I know is in the Jennings, Jennings Hill Cemetery, what's it called? Yeah, in the Jennings Hill Cemetery. I walked in there and, oh my God, did you see the cops in here? Quick, 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 quick. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, now, let's go to William Cushman Sr. of Middleborough. He was born in Middleborough in 1715. He was related by marriage to the very influential earlier prophet Nathaniel Fuller. We'll see his work in a minute. Renowned for, Fuller was renowned for the creation and development of the unique Plymouth County skull design. Cushman, however, was a farmer who started to have great in 1746 at about the same time as Nathan Taylor of Bridgewater. In fact, the two of them, Cushman and Taylor, were the leading characters of their time. Cushman seems to have had all three skulls with all capital inscriptions. He died in 1768, a wealthy man. This one is in Jenny's hair. I find it remarkably handsome as a stone. The elegant borders, the strange skull, I love the conception of the wings, the feathers of the wings. And above it is a rosette. The rosette is very common in New England, gravestone, uh, carving art. Uh, it can be found on Roman tombstones as well. I, I don't know what it signifies, but we do see a lot. But it is so beautifully laid out, uh, I can't help but admire it. And then there's something curious about that stuff. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what's curious about that skull. Uh, it has the eye sockets, the typical triangular type nose thing. But what on earth is Below the nose. Peter Banish, in his book, The Maths of Orthodoxy, spends endless, endless pages on just that figuration. And he calls it a mouth mark. And all the carvers in Plymouth County and over into Bridgewater used the mouth mark. I have no idea what it means. But I will come back to it in a minute on another story. Uh, I have mentioned that John New spent uh, about a decade in the South Shore, and after he left Abington, the Pratt family of Abington took up carving and based their designs rather poorly, uh, not bad, on John New's work. You might casually think this is a John New work, it isn't. Everything in there is taken from John Newton, but not done quite, quite as well. Now, okay, here we go. Nathaniel Fuller of Plimpton. 
He goes way, way back. He was born in 1687. He was by trade a housewife and stonemason. His intellectual, prolific work, all skulls, is found in Plymouth and Bristol counties. He carved for 40 years and died in 1750. Peter Banish, in his book, says, Weak as a craftsman, he was gifted with a relentless imagination. His work developed in three stages, but through it all, the stones are distinguished what Danish calls mouth marks below the nose on the skull. And those mouth marks, if you see enough, stones of his and other carvers who he influenced, uh, the mouth marks are quite varied. And Venish attempts to make some sense of what these men were doing. This one of Nathaniel Fuller is quite clear. You see it? A heart. And the heart, of course, is the love and affection for the deceased, etc. Uh, what I didn't find was a photograph of an even more curious mouth mark that Bainish has trouble, lots of trouble with. In place of the heart, you will find a profile face. Sometimes profile with one eye, sometimes two eye. What is the profile of the face doing on a skull image? The only thing I can come up with, and Danish somewhat alludes to it, is that in the Middle Ages, and who knows for how much longer, it was commonly believed that the soul escaped by way of the mouth. And since we've seen that these image, head images on stones are representations of the soul, we call them soul effigies, it makes sense then Nathaniel Fuller, still immersed in this ancient theology about the soul, would put on his stones little tiny profile heads. No one else in particular. Uh, sorry, I don't have one. But again, it ties with well that notion of well, what are all these little designs under the nose all about on skulls. And in those days, of course, we get quite a few illustrations of the variety that occurs there. Okay, this one is Hoop Cemetery. Uh, yeah, this one is in um, so I think it's in the South Cemetery, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But anyway, I'm not saying oh, just kind of work here. Soul of Philippine. Beza Soul was born in Plumpton in 1750. His stone carving father and brothers migrated northwest into western Massachusetts and Vermont. There were 43 soul carvers in the 18th and 19th century. Huge gravestone carving family. But Beza 
uh, went to Deerfield and then returned in 1774 to Middlebar to carved in this area. He married a close relative of the carver, Noah Cushman of Middlebar, and after 1791, they sold to Rock again to northwestern Connecticut. He is best known for his characteristic winged, jowl face, winged soul effigies. Author, strong relief with the jowls, little bulging owls, eyes so typical of the soul bears. And this one is in the old powder house cemetery. This one is in the old high house in the hills. Now, one last copy. Bill Dan Washburn of Kingston. Bill Dan Washburn was born in 1762. He was a drama boy in the Revolutionary War. He married and had 15 children. His large home was a cabin and was still standing uh, in uh, Kingston. I only want to show one stone of the Dan Washburn in East Bridgewater for the Reverend John Andrew, uh, delivering his sermon from his clothes, uh, and again, the interesting part is the leafage there, which we saw on its chains. John Hugh Stone. I don't know if you remember that. <coughs> this is an imitation of a John New Stone uh, for the Reverend Samuel Brown that's in Abington. And here is John Hugh's version. <laughs> a very charming uh, uh, actually, it's a representation of the minister uh, and with the deacons. The whole stone is quite, quite wonderful by the madman John New. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, here we are, with the cheery blessing of the Reverend Brown from the lectern at the old Bridgewater Historical Society. We say goodbye to this tour of the gravestones in Bridgewater cemeteries and some of the men who come out there. Thank you.
connected to the art corner. Yeah. The slide previous to this was the, the carver that was done in Kingston. I didn't catch his name. What was the name of the carver from Kingston? Oh, this no, this one's John New. Yeah, the prior to that. Oh, the previous one was Bill Dad. Bill Dad Washburn? Washburn. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, that one built that washburn. Okay. Imitate a stone and build a washburn was from Kingston, so we he would have known the stone. And his is an imitation, but <laughs> you don't imitate John New better than John New did. <laughs> okay. Anything else I can Yes. How long would it typically take in uh, a car or two actually carve a stone? As a good one. I, you would not believe the amount of time it goes into carving a stone. I've known stone carvers, I've been in their shops, I've watched how they work, I've talked to them about this very matter. And one carver in Rhode Island, uh, she told me that, oh, it's easy to learn to use the hammer and the chisel. That's all it was used. So it's easy to learn. That's one thing. The other thing is the time it takes. And I asked uh, Nick Benson in Newport. Well, Nick Benson got to be probably the best known gravestone carver in America. Uh, and I said, Nick, how long will it take? Will it take him someone to carve these stones? He said, a couple of weeks. And if you could see how they work, chip, 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 you know, you know, the letter, every, and it has, the letters have to be done like this, the relief work, chip, 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 chip. Hours and hours and hours. And the estimate of two weeks, I find rather modest, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And you have to remember also that Greystone Cotton, for all these people I've talked about tonight, was not their main profession necessarily. That they were yeomen, farmers, or uh, had other trades. And the cotton was done. And Nick Benson said, well, they didn't do it all at once, sit down and start carving, and then two weeks later they finished. It was on and off. Maybe at night, by candlelight, or uh, bad weather, who knows. But uh, at least two weeks minimum. Some of these that we've seen probably were even more. So these folk artists, dedicated enormous amounts of time to their work. It's great, great folk art. A lot of it is worthy of a museum. A lot of it is stolen and sold to collectors for thousands of dollars. Uh, they're recognized as uh, primary uh, folk artwork of the 18th century. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, as you saw, they have a limited lifespan. And it, it grows incrementally. That stone I showed you that took that photograph was 25 years ago. And in 25 years, it's been all eaten up. It's gone, essentially. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you.